Okay, probably probably time to start for real. So let me say hello and welcome and introduce myself. I am Simon Wallace. I'm one of the committee members of the consultancy specialist group. And um, also on screen at the moment, you can probably see Alan War, who is the chair of the consultancy specialist group, and Antonio Hidalgo, who is another committee member. And very importantly, um, Antonio is the person who will be monitoring any um, chats, questions, comments, hands raised from yourselves. So um, if you do want to talk to us, and we, uh, we much encourage you to send in questions and comments, um, the easiest way to do it is on chat. Um, and uh, alternatively, put a hand up and we might come to you. And uh, just, just to remind you to stay on mute, whoever's door that works <laughs> in the background. <laughs> and um, one person you can't see, however, is Darlene Basu, who is the chair of the Central London and North London branches. Uh, it is a joint session with them. So, uh, Dalim, if you're there, would you like to say hi? Yes, of course. And welcome, everybody. It's really great to have you all here. And I even see there's a sleepless person from Malaysia. Wow, kudos to you and welcome as well. But this is indeed a fantastic occasion and I'm really pleased to be doing this collaboratively. Um, I'm the chair of um, North London and Central London branches, as Simon mentioned, and that's a great collaboration. We've got loads of fabulous BCS colleagues and so on. And the work of BCS is large, of course. We really welcome opportunity, your opportunities like this to do things with other groups. So thank you very much, Alan, Simon, Antonio, and go for it. Okay, well, thank you. Let's move on to today's business. Uh, we have Paul Taylor, who is speaking on effective research techniques. Uh, Paul is a consultant with over 30 years experience of implementing change across the financial services, oil and gas charities and professional bodies sectors. Uh, he's written and spoken on a variety of subjects such as change management, freelancing technology, financial services, research approaches. Uh, he's chair and NED for a variety of industry and social enterprises covering gambling addiction and performing arts and for BAME community. And uh, finally, he is an associate lecturer for the Open University STEM School teaching technology management. Um, so it should be a great session tonight. Um, Paul, over to you. OK, thank you. I'll just hope you can all hear me OK. I'll just share my screen. So down. I won't go through all that stuff again because uh, as Simon presented me far better than I could ever present myself. So, uh, so Simon, if you're ever struggling for any work, let us know and I will uh, employ you as a PR consultant for myself. Um, but let us move on to the actual uh, 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 the, uh, talk of the presentation. So before we sort of dive into the what's and the how's and what we can do, Let's just sort of talk about what is actually research. So if you was to Google search, uh, a research, do a Google search on research, so effectively you're researching research, you, you'll find many definitions like anything on Google. But there's, there's two here I just particularly picked out, which I quite liked, actually. I think the first one is the investigate systematically. And the key point is around systematically. Um, research isn't a sort of like a spray approach and you know hunting around looking everywhere it's a very very controlled and uh, and in uh, uh, sort of like structured mythology and, and a way of thinking again more of that later in the slides and um, again the other one I quite liked which is almost the same as the one on the above the uh, investigation into and the study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reap new conclusions and that's a very very long-winded way of saying the idea is you're trying to find something out find new conclusions you want to establish facts so again, the key points are there, and this is going to be a key theme of everything, is everything is systematic and you're trying to do it for a purpose. So why is it important? Um, the ability to perform effective research uh, is, is, I think, a key capability for everyone. 
uh, whether you work in technology, academia, sales, the, Her Majesty's government and other governments, I think what you could do. And the research it doesn't have to be these great big projects to find out, you know, how many people were fans of Donald Trump on Facebook or anything like that. It's a wide range of stuff. It can be anything small tactical, you know, trying to work out where to go on holiday when the uh, COVID restrictions eventually release around the world, all the way to to determine where are you going to build your new factory to allow global domination. So therefore, just going through this is... Um, I'm going to structure this little talk in five main parts uh, and it, I'll put it, 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 pull it in a very sequential way. So, uh, so from the left, um, again, like most things, before you dive into the detail of you know, interviewing people and creating questionnaires and coming up with all sorts of like standard deviation and all the other great things statistics like to do. It's very important you do um, some upfront decisions, you know, perfect planning prevents poor performance. So before you dive into stuff, uh, it's very important to think about before what you're trying to do. Uh, the second area is around ethics and confidentiality. Um, this is a, a key element, actually, and it's reasonably new to be taken quite seriously. Uh, people who have been very, very uh, generally want to try and do the right thing, i.e. ethical, uh, and uh, it's amazing how ethical could be now when there are criminal prosecutions for misuse of data. Uh, so people, uh, uh, future now, ethics is a very key area and confidential uh, data is good, as is important as well. If you're gathering lots of data on individuals for some research, it's very important that you uh, maintain that data, keep it confidential and, fit, and only use it for the reasons you collect it for. Again, more on that later. Uh, then it's going through various techniques to actually gather data. Uh, once you gather the data, you need to analyze it, you know, because obviously data could be very raw, multiple forms, uh, uh, incomplete, contradictory, and therefore you just need to analyze the data. And the last thing is the final decision. As I said before, there's often there's a real purpose you know, for a final decision that can range, as I said before, anything from choosing a holiday uh, or determining where to uh, build a new factory or off where to offshore software development, etc. So if we take these individually one by one, so the first one, as you can probably see on the orange button, is upfront decisions. Uh, again, uh, we can think about the upfront decisions uh, is actually probably three main areas. Uh, the first area is the senior forum to oversee the research. Ultimately, um, you're doing research for somebody or something. You know, if it's a holiday, it's for yourself or the wife or the husband or boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, but in most cases, <laughs> you're doing some sort of like professional research. There will be a steer co or a senior meeting that needs to do that. Um, therefore, this senior forum needs to be agreed. You know, it could be, as I said before, a working group, steering group, a board of directors. Uh, if you're doing some sort of academia research, it could be like a doctoral panel. Uh, if you're doing, you know, I mean, I've done some work for charity and it's for the charity commission. Yeah, so it, it, you need, there's some sort of higher authority you're doing the research for. They can provide uh, as well as uh, three main issues. First of all, they are very good for escalations and decisions, you know, because despite all the best planning you can do, you will have problems. Uh, uh, and no doubt if you're having problems with research, you need to somebody to go to and say, look, I'm having problems. I've, I've got these options. What can we do to try and resolve it? Uh, this, the other one is guidelines on time scale and funding. Um, most research um, is often portrayed as you've got all the time in the world to do the research, but realistically, there isn't enough money for anything. Uh, therefore, you have a limited amount of funding. So therefore, you have to really use your funding quite well, like any project. And likewise, you may have a time scale. Yeah, you may have, for example, you've only got three months to do the research uh, and therefore that needs to be taken into account. And last but not least is the final approval of the research, i.e. Um, ultimately, uh, they will, as it, once you come to the final business decision, the over the forum, such as a working group or a steering group or board of directors, will make a final, uh, will actually oversee and finally approve the research. Uh, the next one is uh, once you've agreed who's going to oversee the research is a what's called an RO or research objective to give it its full name. And this is actually what are you really trying to investigate? What are you really trying to research? And what are you really trying to find out? And this is actually amazingly hard to do sometimes because you think you've got an idea of what you want to do, but you don't really know what you need to do. And it's very important, again, because it's very at the front of the decision, you have to have very clear research objectives for what you're trying to do. Uh, normally, you can look at research objectives in two ways. You can do a top-down objective, 
where effectively you're trying to test a scenario or to test a specific issue. For example, and with the sorry, and with this test in this specific issue, you will have an answer either like a yes or a no answer. Um, so it could be like, for example, I've used there, uh, should we open an office in France? So the answer might be yes, but you need to be aware of the following, you know, taxation issues or, or corporate issues or language issues or uh, uh, to customs issues, sh or should we purchase a company? And uh, the answer will be yes, we should purchase them, but beware of this, or no, we shouldn't purchase them because of this X, Y, and Z. So that's a very yes or no answer. The other way is a, a opposite is a very bottom up objective to investigate an area, and this is very much around almost like obtaining data, uh, and it's much more wider and. Um, uh, and Personally, I find it much more interesting, uh, but obviously it's much more mainly because you find out more information. And it's because it's an open question, it's very much more like saying, where should we move manufacturing? Should we purchase a company? Should we go on holiday? Uh, should we do something else? It tends to be a very open area. I think the challenges I've had over the years working on this is where people confuse the two, uh, where you have a, 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 a bottom up objective, what is our strategic direction? But everybody knows the answer is going to be offshore everything to uh, uh, to the Far East or something like that. But that's obviously a, a more of a sort of thing. And you just have to be very, very careful that you're, you're very clear about what the objective is. Um, once you really understand what the objective is, I, what you're really trying to understand, whether it's top down or bottom up, you need to look at the research questions. And this is a case of very much where you try and break down the research objective, i.e. the high level thing that you're trying to do the research for and working all the hours that God sends to do, down into a number of li limited, uh, sorry, a number of uh, questions uh, that you can actually specifically go and ask around to get the research objective. Uh, so, for example, you may have a, uh, the research objective maybe along the lines of, shall we go and buy a new, uh, buy this company? But the research questions were saying, does it fit with our strategy? Does it have, uh, will it actually, do, would, would it match our client base? Would it contradict our products? Will it, um, uh, is it a good move from us from a PR point of view? Would it distract us from any other parts of the business we're doing? So, therefore, you've got the research objective and you've broken it down into a number of narrow questions that you can answer. Again, um, as I mentioned before, you have top down research objectives, uh, generally narrow focus and a closed question. Again, use it because you're, after, you're trying to test something. So the question there is open an office in France. And the questions are, you know, to, to get to the yes, you should open an office in France or no, we shouldn't. You want to know what it would cost, how much it would cost to open the office, what is the impact to other EU offices. So you've got a very, very number of sharp yes or no questions that you can do to try and close down the uh, research objective. And conversely, looking at the other way around, uh, very much bottom up. Again, it's very open, exploratory and wide questions. You know, so, for example, you've got a question, where should we move manufacturing? So the questions would be along, you know, where, you know, where are the main areas of expertise? What are our competitors are doing? If we were to move manufacturing, would our uh, supply chains extend? Would our customers get annoyed? Um, so that's that. So I think the this to bear is the uh, the main three uh, upfront decisions. And again, it comes down to before you start spending time doing work and everything, it's very important to sort of, a decide who's going to actually approve and oversee the research, some higher authority. Work out the uh, research objective. I what is are you really really trying to find out? Again, don't be scared. It takes a long time to work this out. And then once you've got the research objectives, you break it down to some more pragmatic, um, sensible questions that you can actually uh, answer to meet the objective. Right, that probably covers the first chevron of sorts. So as you're saying there, we've done all the upfront decisions, um, which is basically all the, uh, uh, basically sort of stretching, setting a di direction, I guess, uh, or a project, or a, a sort of, like a, a, or the, or the process. The next area is ethics and confidentiality. So again, there's two main areas here, ethics and confidentiality. And if we look at ethics first, uh, so and the first question is, why is it important? Um, I think the key point is uh, research is not an island, um, which is a very sort of long winded saying. You can't do research without speaking to other people, getting data off of other bodies, other groups. So you will, t you will take data of other people. The data that you may uh, provide or the data you may gather when you're doing a research project, you know, it could be very uncomfortable and discovered if the person who provided it becomes public. 
you know, for example, if you analyse the, you know, for example, I remember youngs ago when I did some work, one of my charitable areas, we were doing work around gambling addiction, uh, and, and and we were asking people about a, a very number of personal matters around, you know, trying to work out and is any social profiling that causes gambling addiction. So therefore, you know, if you if, if you're going to be asked uh, are providing or you're going to be gathering this very awkward data or uncomfortable data, you know, the people who are going to give it to you want to be pretty sure that you're not going to go publish it on Facebook or put it on the report or publish it on the Daily Mail or one of these journals. And also having good ethical standards, the researcher needs to be held to account. And uh, most academic, when I've worked for a number of academic bodies, they've got pretty strong ethical guidance on it, really. And then when you go through the various doctoral boards and research boards, you get quizzed pretty heavily about the ethical side of it. In a strange way, the last piece of research I did, I got quizzed more heavily about ethics than I did about the actual research itself, which is probably a good thing. And a lot of organisations you work for, I've worked for a number of financial services firms, they have quite strong policies around gathering data on their clients. Uh, and the areas that you can look at, the first one is, oh, I say, is around informed consent, uh, which is a sort of like a, a legalese work saying anybody who wants to be in research needs to be invited to participate in the research. So people shouldn't be involved in any research projects or any company shouldn't be resumed in any research projects unless they know they're actually being involved. Uh, they should be given, they should get idea to give their consent based on the information provided about the project. Again, um, the, uh, this is important, so they know, they, they know what they're going in for, and they should be made aware of their right to withdraw from the project at any time for any reason. Uh, the problem with this, you do actually, a lot of social media platforms struggle with this, uh, is because they, you know, a lot of social media platforms will use your like Facebook likes or your Twitter re retweets and your LinkedIn shares to determine what uh, your likes are, and that's a lot of data people can research on. So what you tend to find in a lot of these uh, research platforms and other websites, there's a lot of cookie information about saying what, what the data is going to be used for. And you may recall, I think was it two years ago, three years ago, there was this upgrade to all the cookie laws that you had to sort of like confirm what cookies were being used for and what you can use the data for. I think also one participant is that you should guarantee anonymy of data. Uh, I mean, not all people do this. I think that is if, if you can guarantee anonymy, a lot of people are far more comfortable to actually participate. Uh, I often, whenever I do any research, offer the, each of the participants a free copy of any outputs from the research. Um, I'm not too sure. All of them have said yes. All of them have sent. I don't think anybody's actually read it because nobody's ever come back to it. But, you know, there's no harm in passing the research out. And I think the other thing is when people are being involved in a research project, you shouldn't really hassle them regarding their involvement. Um, normally when I do interviews, if I can't get a response after two email chases, I assume they're not interested and just ignore them and move on to somebody else. Uh, the challenge you have there is you can hassle people and they won't, if they're pretty annoyed, they won't be helpful. So again, uh, why is this important? And I mentioned around confidentiality. So it's, these two things overlap. Uh, ethical issues before, and as I mentioned earlier, there are now some very stringent legal rules around ownership of data. Uh, I think, as you're probably all aware, uh, for those, unless you've been sleeping under rock, uh, the, the main law, I've got the UK, but it's actually European law, but it's J uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, Regulation GDPR, uh, which pers looks after personal information. The key point there is that it, it, this uh, incorporates a, so I, uh, there are also some similar legislations around the world. So if you're doing work in uh, the US, you've got the Cal uh, Californian, that should be a uh, Consumer Privacy Act, which is, again, a reasonably recent piece of new regulation. Uh, Japan have got their Act on Protection of Personal Information, and there's the Australian Privacy Act from uh, well, about 23 years ago. Uh, while the dynamics of those are slightly different, they've all got the same uh, sort of key principles. The idea is that all the data is used for lawful purposes. Uh, the, the purpose is limited to the, the, what you gather the data for. You only data minimization is a nice legal phrase for saying you only collect the data for the areas you want to use it. You store it for sorry. You, you ensure the data is accurate. You store it for the limited amount of time that's required. You ensure it's all confidential. And the and there is somebody on the research project or in the organisation doing it is accountable. Uh, which is a very polite way of saying that they will get reported to the police and the regulator if anything goes astray. And it's amazing when you've got a, a legal threat above you, how ethical and moral people can be. Uh, again, a uh, slight repetition on this slide, the uh, the rights of the data subject, you know, again, before they need to be informed. 
Uh, they need to opt out if it's requested. They don't want their data to be stored. Uh, they want deletion. They need access to the data. And you can't discriminate against a person for not exercising their rights. Therefore, again, this is quite a lot of legal jargon, and uh, I'm sure there's uh, magazines and uh, papers that will explain this form much better than I will actually explain it. But I think the key point is when you are taking data, especially personal data, you need to be fully aware of all the legal constraints and controls around that data uh, and make sure your research plan and all the processes within your research plan completely look after that. Otherwise, you could end up in some serious trouble. Okay, so uh, by way of recap, uh, we've covered uh, the upfront decisions. Um, we've gone through all the uh, defining uh, the, I know, a forum that needs to look after it, what the, the high level research objective and how that's broken down into questions. Uh, we've now uh, discussed the ethical and confidentiality elements uh, of data and the data you keep and the importance that uh, A, you need to be ethical and B, you need to follow any laws and legal requirements that cover that. Otherwise, and believe me, there are serious repercussions if you're caught out doing that. Uh, the next item we get onto the bit more the uh, data gathering, which is more um, uh, sort of like a, a actually going out to collect the data. Uh, again, I don't think Antonio, there's been any questions on the sl on the um, chatter box. Hey Paul, can you Where hear me now? I can hear you now. I can see okay, you now. good. <laughs> yeah, I was muted before. Uh, so, yeah, we have had a small conversation here. So, we have uh, uh, Katia Pana, uh, Panta uh, asking the question of uh, what will be the recommendation. And it's a question as to, the, to, to yourself, to, to the speaker, but also it's uh, an open question, maybe from other uh, the perspective of other people, which is what will be the recommended uh, channels uh, for free or cheap source of academic papers. Um, we have had a couple of uh, people answering questions, answering this, this question. So we have had Chris and Liz. So they have been mentioning Semantics Escolar, Arrive, uh, BioArchive, uh, Twitter, Telegram channel, LinkedIn, Reddit, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, mm -hmm. Academia, Elsevier. Um, I'm just going to pause there and I'm going to let you give us your, um, your point of view. What are your views on was that research. on the research papers you may know? Uh, where do what are the best way to get uh, sources for academic papers? Uh, yeah. Our sources, big pardon. Um, um, uh, I need to upgrade my internet. Uh, yeah, there's thousands of ways. I tend to use um, uh, Google Scholar. That's quite good. There's some good researches on that. Uh, like any Google search, you've got to be very careful for the words because you end up with all sorts of bizarre stuff that you can't find. Uh, I actually use IT Now, actually. I'm not trying to plug it, but IT Now has got some good, uh, if you search for IT Now, a lot of IT Now documents get posted on the ex Oxford web pages. Uh, I think uh, ResearchGate is very good. Um, there's also one which I'm, I can't remember for the hell of me what it's actually called, actually. Um, I'll have to, if I take that down, Antonio, there's a, uh, the website I use and I can't remember what it's called. It's also very, very good. Um, I, because I do some work for Middlesex University, Middlesex University subscribe to a number of forums globally. Uh, on their own website so they have like a mini google version on there when you log on when you become a student there and you can go in there and you might type for something you know uh, i don't know gdpr impact on research something like that and it'll give you a host of documents on those areas as well uh, other areas i find quite useful uh, for uh, not so much academia research but other researches i will call some of the more the highbrow uh, uh highbrow uh, newspapers uh, things like the Times are quite good, uh, Sunday Times, tele uh, maybe not Telegraph, that's a bit political, but Independent, uh, because if you look at their, some of their supplements, they may say um, they'll have like a guest author talking about I don't know, the impact of Brexit on cross-channel ferries or something like that. And that person's obviously a serious journalist. I mean, he or she may have written some very good papers. Uh, other areas I find are very useful are a lot of the professional bodies. I mentioned IT now for technology. Uh, the Charter Management Institute, I've got, um, uh, their online portal has got lots and lots of uh, academia articles on there. Uh, the Royal Society of Arts, RSA, they're very good as well. They've got a large number of papers as well. Uh, yeah, but what I'll try and do, Antonio, um, um, the other question regarding the sources of academia paper, that website, which is, I think it's Oxford Press, but they've actually changed the name. I'll try and find, I just can't remember from the head of me that it's called. And the last one that is very, very good is the Harvard Business Review. That's an excellent one. Um, it's a, it's a, 
I say it's a, say it's a great read. It's like reading a book every month when it comes out. It's very, very heavy, very, very deep. Uh, but when you subscribe to the Harvard Business Review, uh, what you actually get is access to their online portal. Um, so there's quite a lot of articles that are approved by the Harvard Business Review, but don't actually go into the physical paper magazine. But you can actually search on and you're talking for people, you know, I mean, if you can get, you know, if you're accepted by Harvard, you, you, you're the top of your cheap train, you know. Uh, other areas I would suggest would be things like um, um, uh, uh, I would say the more professionals like Wiley, the more professional publishers and people like that. They do a lot of probably not papers, but more. Uh, textbooks and stuff like that as well. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Really, really extensive. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I like a good read, as you can probably see. So, um, any other questions, Antonio, before we dive on to the next chunk? No, I think that's the only one that we have uh, so far. Hmm. Thank you, Paul. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Um, the, uh, as I said before, we've gone through upfront decisions, we've done ethics and confidentiality. Uh, and then we let's move on to data gathering, which is actually probably my favourite part of all of it, really. Um, so um, there's a great a phrase that academics use, uh, and it's actually one of my favourite words, and it, this presentation gives me an excuse to say it, uh, which is called uh, epistemology. And I believe it's Latin, like most phrases are. And basically is around, I've got around there, the theory of knowledge, especially in regards to its methods of ability, scope, etc. But very highly is ha basically how do you find data or how do you define data or how do you define knowledge? And it looks at in the different ways. It's very important to discuss this because it actually sort of like, uh, leads very heavily into the rest of the presentation. So basically, you can almost have like uh, two extremes of type of data you can have. And I've I'll put one on the left, one on the right. I never know which way around. Is you can have data that's on the left, uh, which is I call it quantitative, um, uh, which is actually where the data is very, uh, basically it's very clear uh, what statistics, uh, what uh, scientists call there's only one truth. And it would be things like st stats, facts, spread, uh, uh, computer programs, where there's no ambiguity about it. You know, two and two makes four. Don't matter how many times you add two and two, it always makes four. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, academia has called it positivism or objectivism. On the right-hand side, you have uh, a thing called qualitative, uh, which is almost the same word, but the N is replaced by the L, uh, which sends spell check into area. It is where the data isn't complete. The data is um, can be interpreted. Uh, it's subjective to people's point of views. So, for example, where you would say quantitative is very much stats and uh, computer programs and Excel spreadsheets, where it's all very, very clear. The same rules are always followed. Qualitative data is where you interpret the data. And that could be like trying to, like my daughter's at university studying history. Uh, there's no way she can actually determine what happened in uh, England in 1857 because no one's around and everybody's dead. Uh, so she tries to interpret the facts. You know, she, she'll try and work out the facts are, read from multiple sources, try and think, well, if the king was trying to do this and the queen was trying to do that, then what happens? Yeah, it's also subjective to people's point of views because Again, because you're trying to interpret the facts, you can put your own human biases on it. And also, again, using history, uh, you try and construct uh, 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 what you know and the facts you've gone and the opinions you've got to try and build up like a, a, a sort of like a knowledge set. Uh, again, a prime example, and obviously you've got realism, uh, which is in the sort of centre in the both uh, in the middle. And a prime example for those who understand football was the offside law. Uh, and this is one that straddles both and causes all sorts of confusion. And, uh, for example, they try and have it as a sort of like quantitative uh, rule. You know, uh, the ball has to be played forward and the ball has to be, you know, there's two players between the last player who plays the ball and the goal and all that stuff to make it crystal clear. But then they chuck in subject to players interfering with play. So effectively, you know, you've got a quantitative rule uh, with lots of subjective around it, which basically means the poor referee and the linesman haven't got a chance. And whatever happens, the losing, uh, losing manager can always blame them. So therefore, um, there's a bit more on this and some more worked examples to try and explain it. Because I imagine it's, it's not the most easiest thing to explain. And, and, and I remember when I was learning this, I found it hard to follow. But the key point thing is, depending on what data you're trying to collect, you need to understand, uh, sorry, depending on what type of data you try and collect, there are different data gathering methods. Uh, you will have different types of data issues. And ultimately, when it comes down to the, the ultimate thing, when you're trying to churn and understand the data, having different types of data, you know, there are different ways of trying to assess them. 
So therefore, uh, I would always suggest, if possible, is to try and look at both types of data. And again, I'll run through some worked examples on that a bit later. Uh, so, so before we dive into this, so basically, uh, the first thing to talk about is, you know, what type of data is required. Uh, once you define that, you should you know, basically who should you collect the data from. Once you determine what the data is and who you should get it from, is the next thing is to say basically how do you collect the data. Again, and then the last bit, I've got some other hints and tips, uh, and uh, which are some various lessons learned that caused me more grey hairs and incompetence over the years. So if we look at what what data is required. So, I mean, actual data gathering itself is a sort of like a, or analyzing data is a massive area and, and will take many hours to discuss. But the key point to really, really think about, if you go back to about 20 minutes ago when I was going through the research, research questions, uh, which obviously are, uh, are fed by the research objective, you need to understand what data do you need to do to answer the research questions. So, again, if the research question is, a, you know, looks like the research objective, do you want to open a new office in Italy? And the research questions around are there tax problems, are there customer problems, are there immigration problems? You need to ensure that you have data to determine whether you can assess what the tax issues are, what the immigration issues are, etc. So again, this is stresses a real importance of getting the research objective and the research question correct. But then again, regarding data, because it's such a wide and a real spongy area, you can look at data in uh, sort of like two lenses. First one is the type of data needed, and the second one is how it can actually be sourced. So um, the two type, there are actually two types of data before we go into the how it can be sourced. Uh, again, it sort of ties with that previous diagram I did before. The first one is quantitative data, uh, which is where data is very numeric, it's basic numbers and other business rules, very much, very logical, very easy flow. Uh, us on the BCS will love all this logical flow. Uh, the advantage to that, it's very efficient, you know, basically, to, as I said before, the sums are always make the same. And it's very easy. It's easy to test. You know, if you're testing numbers in a program, you know, or a spreadsheet, it's easy to test. I think the disadvantage is numbers can be quite black or white uh, and it misses the wider context and therefore can be misleading. Uh, for example, you may have, for example, um, there's a... Uh, one good stat, isn't it? Was it uh, two? Uh, the UK have an average. UK families have two point four children, uh, which is a very good statistical analysis. But effectively, I, I'm not aware of anybody's got point four of a child on their on their on their um, on, on their family. Uh, the other type of data again is the qualitative. Notice the L on the fourth letter, and this is where effectively you have a non-numeric data, and it's where data is opinions and views and interpretations. The, the great advantage of this, it will provide very in-depth assessment, you know, because it's, it's often very textual and very rich and very, very detailed and provides a lot of depth. But the issue with that, it's, uh, and it also allows themes to be discovered. So uh, going back to that question, Antonio, about research papers, you know, for example, you want to do research on, say, uh, the impact of GDPR on X, Y and Z. You download lots of papers, you review them all and you can. Uh, lots of in-depth discussion, and then you allow things to be discovered. The disadvantage is it's it's hard work and it's hard to assess. If you're reading thousands and thousands of pages of what seems like documents, it's very hard. It's very easy just to glaze over and think about something completely different that you should be doing, uh, and it causes a lot of problems. And also, because a lot of the qualitative research papers, using that example, have been written by another researcher, they'll have their own bias. I mean, for example, if you go download a paper on Brexit from the UKIP uh, paper party, you're going to get a very different view of Brexit than from the Lib Dems. You know, so you have to be very careful whether are there any biases on the researcher. So these are actually the two types of data. So basically, uh, how what's the main methods for actually gathering the data? Uh, so there are two main ways. Again, a combination of both is suggested. Uh, the first one is uh, which is called primary primary research, and that's effectively you gather the data yourself. Uh, you do your own research. Uh, the good advantages are they allow you to focus the, the data gathering on the research questions you want. You know, so if you want to find out about taxation in Italy, you can ask the question. Please tell me about taxation in Italy. Uh, the disadvantage it is uh, it's a very lengthy and very costly process because you, you know, you've got to do everything. You literally start with a blank sheet of paper. And the best way, and it involves lots of interviews, research groups, online questionnaires, and it's a, it's, it's a, you really, really have to put a lot of effort in. Uh, 
the other one is uh, after primary secondary research uh, and that's basically reusing research gathered by other people and that question earlier on about uh, sources of academia papers is actually secondary research uh, so the advantages are the data can be about quite quickly you can go onto those websites which i sort of spilled off earlier on log on pay you two pound fifty annual fee and download all the data you want and trawl your way through it the disadvantages are a lot of those papers are written for other reasons. Uh, they may not actually match your actual uh, research question. Uh, so therefore, you know, you, you, you may not be suitable or may not be uh, appropriate. And uh, may, as I mentioned before, these are, because these are, this research is done by somebody else, it'll actually include bias and other people's views and opinions. And uh, examples for that is actually, I wrote down there, sort of government reports, trade associations, news reports, and actually, Antonio, another thing is government papers as well for that list of things as well, is that, uh, you know, uh, UK have a thing called the Office, office of ONS, Office of National Statistics, and the, Inter and the Audit Office, which do provide lots of secondary research. So therefore, you've got two types of research. One is effectively primary, you going out, knocking on people's door, gathering the data yourself, on the secondary one is also trying to pull down data for somewhere else uh, that somebody else has used. Okay, so now you understand what type of data is required. So that's obviously primary and secondary gathering as well as quantitative and qualitative data. The key thing is who should you collect the data from? Uh, again, uh, your target audience is, uh, is important. Again, uh, you don't want to ask the wrong, right, wrong people or, or miss people. So the first one is if you're doing primary research, which by way of recap, you're going out and asking people yourself, you need to know which people to speak to, which firms to speak to, you know, and that stuff like that. You don't want to, you know, when do you want to speak to them, et cetera. If you're going for secondary research, you want to go to, I'll call, uh, credible publications. You don't want to go to, you know, just because it appears on Wikipedia or it appears on Google doesn't mean it's gospel. You want to make sure that you're going to you know, respectable publications written by uh, respectable journal authors, maybe respectable uh, journals as well as decent websites. Um, the total population is uh, is basically who do you speak to? So why are you are you you're collecting uh, primary and secondary data? Uh, there's uh, the total population is everybody you can speak to. So ultimately, at one extreme, if for example you're doing market research on uh, on a new product everybody in the, and it's aimed at people in the uk your total population is effectively everybody in the uk you know, 61 million people uh, which is uh, totally inappropriate to speak to uh, however um, what you need to do is an area which is called sampling <clears throat> and this is quite an important area and i'll probably spend a few more seconds on this than normal just to, just to talk all the way through it Therefore, what you do is when you've got your total population, that could be 60 million people you want to talk to. There's, as I said before, there's no way you can actually speak to all those people. Therefore, what you need to do is create a smaller sample of that total population that you can actually use, um, that you can actually go and speak to to gather data from. The key thing is the uh, is trying to work out how many people do you actually speak to. I mean, 60 million is a lot. You know, do you speak to 5 million? That's still a lot. You know, 500,000 is still a lot. It probably only gets down to sort of like reasonable levels when you get down to 5,000. So the key thing you need to understand is the dynamics of your population, uh, um, as in your total population. So, for example, you know, you can get various stats on, you know, the age, gender in the UK, uh, the gender, the location, uh, the size, if you're looking at a firm or profitability. And what this allows you to do is to try to uh, split all the population out and it allows you to bring a, a, a sample. So let's, to use a very simple example, um, I was doing some work, uh, well, not me, a, pre, a colleague of mine was doing a staff survey, and they wanted to staff survey random uh, uh, some people in a firm on, well, basically, do they like working there? There was 10,000 people in that firm, and they didn't think they wanted to do 10,000 uh, uh, people in the interview because it'd be too long. So what they did is they worked out almost like how many, what, the, what was the uh, gender split, and it was almost like 50-50 men to women. And then, they, and then basically just went down along those lines there. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the sample size down to do 500 people. And because it's 50, 50 percent uh, between men and women, we're going to actually do 50, 50 percent on the sample. Uh, and that was as simple as that. I think the key thing is that the general perception is the bigger the sample, the better. And that's not always the case, really, to be honest. It's more important that the sample represents the dynamics of the population. Uh, for example, I remember working, uh, reading a study years ago about uh, testing fireworks. 
Um, because the makeup of every firework was exactly the same, uh, they tested one in every 10,000. So there was a very small sample. And basically, the key question is basically, how do you create a sample? And again, again, this is a, quite a big area and it would take ages to go through, but I will do a high level view. Uh, and there's a num eight or nine different ways you can do it. I think the first one is uh, it's called a random sample. You generally just pull people out of the hat. You know, so everybody's got the same chance or lack of chance to actually get the um, uh, the uh, included in it. You know, and I say out the hat, you can actually do it electronically these days. Uh, the second one is systematic. Um, and basically what that basically means, you list the sample or the population. Sorry, big pardon. You list the population in some sort of order, age order. And then you work out how many people you want to include in your sample, and then you go down the, the nth person on the list. A prime example of this is often political polls done in the UK. Uh, they want to do voting intentions. Uh, and what they would do is they would pick an area of an area, say like well, I live out in Essex. They would work out that they want, they would list everybody alphabetically or list everybody's house number in order. And they would say, we're going to do every 20th house. So they, did, they just literally work their way down there. Uh, and work along that. Uh, other areas are called stratified. Uh, this is where they divide the populations into little uh, uh, randomly into uh, like groups. So you might have a group uh, uh, that's got all, uh, all your females in. You might have a group that's got all your males in. You might have a group that all your uh, students in. You might have a group that's got all your retirees in. And then once you've got these sort of like separate groups of data, you randomly select from the group. Another area is called clustering. Uh, which is where you put people into like uh, into similar groups and then you just focus on the whole group, I suppose, of individuals. Uh, one of the more common ones, that which is not often publicised, is, is convenience. Again, you may be doing uh, some sampling or you might not have bought a sample for some sort of analysis and you actually go and choose what's available. Uh, you know, it may be a case of, um, for example, um, doing some statistical analysis uh, the next one is judgmental. Uh, again, this is more common on business uh, uh, sampling. Uh, this is where a person uh, selects a sample based on judgments. For example, I've been working, uh, actually last year, I should finished, we were working with, a, with a, 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 a pension fund manager to select a new bank. Uh, for their sort of like banking arrangements, payments, paying the pensions and what have you. What we did was uh, we knew we couldn't go to every single bank in, in Europe on that because it would be too long. So what we did is we employed a, an external consultant to basically do some judgmental sampling saying, we believe that the following five banks are, are the best for you. And we just did that and that was fine. It went through it. And the last one there is called snowball sampling. And the idea is what you do is you, you, you go and speak to some people, uh, include them in the sample, maybe doing a piece of research. And when that research is done, you ask that individual, do you know anybody else I could speak to? And then when they've done that, you, you say, do you know anybody else you can speak to? And in fact, I'm doing a piece of research at the moment uh, for Middlesex University based on asset management, uh, uh, like pension fund management, on guarding the success of change. And it's actually using the snowball sample. So what I've been doing is I, I spoke to 30 people individually to gather their thoughts and gather the data. I am now going to speak to another. Uh, I asked them, can you think of anybody else I can ask? And I've actually got another 60 people. So I want to go and speak to those 60 people and work my way through. And it's uh, the only thing is, though, from a personal point of view, you don't know when you're going to finish. You seem to be speaking to people forever. Uh, key thing is, as you've probably gathered by the chats I've been doing here, sampling is not an easy process. It's a, uh, and it is not a hundred percent exact science. It, it problems you will have problems, and some of these problems can't be worked around. Um, I think the uh, the biggest issue you have is that the sample doesn't doesn't represent the population. Uh, for example, as I mentioned before, they have you know, a staff survey. You're going to do fifty percent women, fifty percent men. You may get one area that you know, none of the women reply. So your staff survey is very lopsided because only uh, ladies are involved, uh, which obviously creates some sort of bias because obviously you, because the uh, sample doesn't represent the population and basically so you have some bias errors. Uh, therefore, as I mentioned earlier, there's no way around this, to be honest with you. Uh, the, um, the challenge you have is it's this a fact of life, the sampling and research, you won't, will not be 100% correct. So therefore, when you do any sort of data gathering, if you're aware that certain areas aren't properly uh, represented, uh, the key thing there is to state any issues and gaps in, 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 in any final reports. Uh, 
it's not a problem having well, ideally it'd be nice to have no issues but if you do have issues it's to, it, they need to be clearly stated so everybody knows right regarding um i don't know if i'm gonna i've seen a few chat messages appear i don't know if antonio if they're just uh, uh sort of general chit chat or, or general questions uh it also gives me yes, a chance I... to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we have had a couple of questions. Uh, we have three. No, I don't know doesn't. if we will have time now. Uh, if you want, I can pass you the first one and you let me know if you want. Yeah, to yeah go for it. The, best one, the first one is from Daniel. Uh, Daniel uh, will be. Uh, the question is regarding uh, ethics and confidentiality. Can mm. data be shared without explicit consent if it's fully anonymized? Uh, I think, actually, fair enough, one of my clients were actually going for a similar problem at the moment. Uh, if it's, as long as you, uh, if the data, if you've got, for example, the data and it's like Mr. Paul Taylor and it's my date of birth, my national insurance number, and that's shared, you can clearly, if you've got, work it back to who I am. If the data, can't, if the personal data is scrambled or anonymized in such a way that you can't trace it back to a, back to the, a human being, then that's fine. Uh, so, for example, you might want to say Mr. Smith, maybe not Mr. Smith. That's a bad example. There's bound to be a Mr. Smith. You might want to say uh, Mr. Test uh, as a name. Uh, and you might want to put the national insurance number as XXXXX, you know, and it's for there. As long as it's completely anonymized, you should be able to share it. Brilliant. Yeah. The next question is from Sean, uh, Sean Lowe. Um a challenge that uh, well, I, I I'm going to I'm going to let Sean read his question. It, it has a little bit uh, of background, yeah. so I will rather Sean. Can you unmute yourself and uh, voice your question, please? Uh, yes, yes, I can. I'm not sure if I'm audible or not. Yes, yeah, yes we you can are. hear you. Hi, you. So one challenge I've had is that when I do qualitative research, I often have to revisit the same sources after reading at a wider scale. So I might read about five papers, but then go back after a while and reread them again, because I only find certain themes and patterns appear after doing a lot of reading. Is there a way of doing qualitative research in a more efficient way in light of this? Um, I'm very much in the old school, a bit like you. I think it's a case of, you know, I mean, uh, you can see on the floor down there, I won't show it to you, but I've got piles of paper and I will go through that and I, uh, um, just do uh, sort of like literature review type stuff, uh, document after document. I know I'm working with um, um, another client of mine is actually trying to use a um, some sort of like, uh, I'm trying to think what the phrase is, uh, inter AI, artificial intelligence, to actually scan documents to try and pull out key themes um, um, to review it. I don't personally, I've seen some of the results. They look okay but it's quite patchy because you know documents are written with different you know, different uh, uh different wording but i think to go back to your question i personally unfortunately the way i would do it is a case of it's this case of just uh, uh lots and lots of reading going all the way through i think the only time i when i do literature reviews or that sort of research you get to a point after a while where you're thinking i'm not learning anything new i've heard this before and that's where you think you can maybe sort of like say well i've finished the review not sure if that answers the question, I'll be honest. Yes, it does. Thank you for the clarification. No, no, no problem. And we have the last question for Andrew. And the question is, uh, how do you go about uh, verifying your sampling methods accuracy? And uh, he puts the example of the election polls getting Trump's victory in 2016 wrong. Um. I think the challenge you have is 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 the um, there's two areas. I th I, the sampling. I mean, the problem you have with any sampling is is trying to get the sample right. I mean, I've spent quite a bit on that, and uh, and if somebody can get a sample right, I'd be amazed with them. I think a lot of the problems they had uh, with the Trump prediction is that they. Um, well, I think the sampling was probably adequate. The actual data collection methods and actually analysing the data was wrong. Um, um, uh, I remember uh, just going back uh, a little bit earlier, maybe not use Trump, but those who may remember a long time ago, um, that there was a prediction that um, oh, I think it was a 92 election in the UK uh, uh, with John Major won. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was, it was 92 or 94, I can't remember that year. He won the election and he was expected to lose it. Uh, and then basically what they found out was they completely were modelling the wrong data. Uh, they weren't asking the right questions coming out. Uh, I think the 
key point there is um, there's no real way of verifying your sample before it. Um, there is a uh, one of the areas I'm going to come to have been under hints and tips is around called doing pilot studies for complex research. Um, one of the issues you can have around a complex piece of research, for example, uh, like if you're doing a PhD type research or if you're doing a um, you know, some of this complex stuff around political stuff, is that while you could there could actually be a defect use a technology term in the actual research process you mean you may not be collecting the right data you not, might not be asking the right questions and even if you're doing all that correctly you, you may not be out analyzing it so one of the areas that you can try and do around sampling is to uh, maybe do some pilot studies that's quite common i mean I, when i was doing my phd you know the pilot stuff saved me many years of wasted effort because you know you run a small pilot project and the amount of feedback you get on that is, is phenomenal the other ways is around it is to use multiple models um, uh, when you do your data analysis models. Uh, I, I, I don't know enough about how, how the Trump stuff worked, but I know when we I do a lot of work in financial services, I mentioned earlier, what they will do is they will try and analyze the risk to a pension fund to ensure ultimately there's enough money for pensions to get paid. Uh, and obviously, you've got the core data. Uh, but what they do when they do their research is run six or seven different models based on different assumptions just to try and give different points of view. And if there's any massive variance in the models, like one model says, yeah, you've got loads of money, we can, you know, pensions are fine. Or the other model comes back and says, well, I don't think we've got any money. It, it, it creates like some areas. Uh, so I think the key thing is, is uh, obviously, uh, there's no way to ensure that all the data is correct, um, and especially with electrics, because people lie. You know, I mean, I always remember, I mean, I mean, going back to, I'm really showing my age, I mean, I live in Essex, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher was winning every single vote here, uh, my miles, but you couldn't find a Tory voter if, if you went looking for it. So there's obviously a lot of people were vote, were saying one thing, but not doing something completely different. Um, but I think the key thing generally is to use multiple research techniques and multiple models. The more you do, you, especially if they're completely different, albeit they're going for the same objective, it allows you to compare likeness and things like that. Brilliant. Thank you. That's good. Uh, uh, anything else? That's all the questions so far. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. okay, so we've done uh, what data is required. Uh, we've done who should collect the data from. And this comes to a very mute point, actually, comes into how do we actually collect the data. So um, let me just scroll forward. Again, um, there are, you could probably say is there's multiple ways you can sample the data. Uh, there's multiple methods you can actually collect the data and, and some are good, some are bad, some are more appropriate, some are inappropriate. Uh, the actual method depends on the sample available. Uh, if you've your sample for whatever reason, you've got 10,000 people in there. That's a hell of a lot of interviews to do. So, yeah, I mean, so basically maybe you've got 10,000 people interviews is not the best way of doing it. If you're the type of data that's required, again, if it's qualitative, which is, as you mentioned, is like opinions and facts and very rich, that's uh, the things like interviews are obviously the best way to gather that information and, you know, that focus groups and stuff like that, where things like quantitative data is uh, because it's very scientific and sorry, sorry, statistical. I mean, it's a lot better uh, to gather that um, from like, you know, gather that from like databases and other areas. Uh, sources of data required, again, primary, as I mentioned before, you go out and get the data yourself. So that would, uh, obviously means a lot of legwork running around streets and uh, trying to get the data. And secondary, you're using other people's data. Um, so that's very much along the lines of uh, like literature review, which was one of the questions, uh, the one before last. <coughs> also, it depends on the time to complete the work. If you've got to do the research in, in, in one month, uh, you might not have a time to do lots of interviews, so you might have to go to some sort of online uh, questionnaire. Amount of money to spend on the researcher. Uh, interviews are expensive. Online questionnaires aren't. Uh, the other thing is the skills of the researcher. Um, some, some researchers are very, very good at gathering statistical information. Uh, I know my supervisor, my PhD, is an absolute boffin at this. And he, he amazes me He's, what he knows about it. Uh, but he freely admits he's not very good at interviewing people for research, you know, so he, he, he will often get a lot of research on that. And there's a number of other factors which will come through to as we as we work our way through. Uh, so I've pulled together uh, sort of like a grid. Again, it's a bit busy, but hopefully when you get the slides, you can use it as a um, sort of like a research thing. Uh, so just take it from the top. Uh, an interview, uh, which is very good for quality data and it's primary because you're going to get the data yourself. Uh, it allow the advantages are it allows you to ask very detailed questions and it's very very face 
And to be honest, if people are more likely to be open and honest on a one to one basis, um, um, and also you know, as long as you, you guarantee confidentiality and stuff like that, it's all perfect. Uh, but it is very time consuming uh, to arrange interviews. I mean, you've got an interview script, you've got to arrange the interview, you've got to contact people, I mean, and then arrange the interview, you've got to type up the notes. So even for the simplest interview, it could take six or seven hours time to put everything together to do one interview. And if you're doing several hundred of these, time shoots through the roof. There's sort of like a sort of a hybrid version of this, which I call focus groups, um, which is effectively you get a large number of people in a meeting room and you sort of do like a joint interview, a sect, uh, um, uh, although it, it does need some planning. Again, it's very good for qualitative data, like opinions and facts and what have you. Uh, and it's again, because you're going out to do it yourself, it's primary research. The advantages are they're quicker than one-to-one interviews because you can speak to more than one person at, a, uh, at the same time. And in a, in a good way, if you get a good bunch of people in a room, the dynamics allow ideas to come out. And I've been in focus groups and somebody asked a point and I think, good Lord, I didn't even think of that. And then all the old creative juices start flowing around. Uh, the downside is uh, if you have one uh, person in the group, they can actually dominate the group. They can be quite aggressive. Yeah, you get somebody with a particularly large mouth and very strong opinions. They can actually take over the group and... Uh, cause arguments um, and um, basically it's quite hard work to manage uh, but the downside to that there could be other people in the uh, uh, on the folks group who are, feel it, well, intimidated to not provide their input which is the whole purpose of the thing again uh, moving on to something less uh, sort of face to face the next one is questionnaire surveys you can uh, gather qualitative information uh, as in facts and opinions on the um, uh, via questionnaire but it's not always the best way of doing it. It's very good often for things like statistical information and stuff like that. Uh, again, primary research, because you're doing it yourself. Obviously, you're going to write your own questionnaires and surveys. Again, questionnaires can be uh, quick to set up. Um, is it SurveyMonkey do all this sort of stuff? And lots of other people do that. You can issue to a wide range of people. As long as there's an internet link, you know the email address, you can contact them. So in theory, you can contact anybody in the whole world with an email address. Uh, people can answer them at their own time and their own speed, <clears throat> you know, um, and the data is kept collected in a standardized way, which is very good when you get onto analyzing the data. Um, the, the downside to this, uh, again, are the uh, people may not respond to the questions properly. Uh, people may under misunderstand what's being asked. Uh, the key point, if there's question, errors in the questionnaire, i.e. the questions are wrong or you uh, or they're mis badly worded, uh, uh, people will not fill in, fill in the questionnaire properly. And the key point is that once the questionnaire is done, that's it, you're finished. You can't go back and ask any more questions, you know, which is a shame, really, because if you get some good feedback and data in that, you can't go back and say, can you explain this in more detail to me? Uh, desk research, uh, uh, literature review, analyzer documentation, it has many names. Uh, again, it's a... Uh, you can get quantitative and qualitative data. It's very much around the uh, uh, secondary data because you're using somebody else's data. The advantages are of this gathering this data is very cheap and could be quick to do, as long as you've got an email address, as long as you've got an internet connection and all those lists, those firms, which I can't remember now, which I provided to Anthony, Antonio earlier on, you can go on those and download the data. Uh, the key point, the disadvantages are there may not be sufficient documentation available. If you've got very, very specific research objective and underlying questions, you may not be able to get it. Uh, and also, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you, you may not actually match your research objectives. Another one which is quite keen is observations. And this is often used in, with young children and animals. For those who may remember days at Attenborough sitting in a, in a jungle full of around by gorillas. It says basically you either observe or you go and work in the area that you're being researched. Um, and you can get all sorts of data, uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative. And, and again, it's primary research because you're doing it yourself. And because you're actually inside the area, like in a school class or sitting inside a, a, a zoo or sitting inside an office observing what's actually happening, you are gain some really, really good insights and well, why people do things and some good data. The downside with that is it does take a long time. You know, if you're waiting for something to happen, you could sit there for hours to happen. 
And the other point is, um, as those who remember, the, uh, there's, a, there's a some sort of syndrome that uh, was actually mentioned in Jurassic Park. When people are being uh, monitored or being observed, they react differently than they would do without that, you know, uh, uh, which is actually a strange, you know, I mean, they may actually uh, uh, do their job better, they may do their job worse, but you, you're not after that, you're trying to find out what they actually do. And another one that comes down is data feeds. Um, uh, I mean, and this is like raw data feeds. Again, it's typically quantitative data, yeah, statistical data, uh, and um, you can use it. You can create your own data feeds as well. Uh, the advantage is it's quick to assess. You can download it into a big spreadsheet and all these other statistical patches like SPSS and download it. Uh, the issue is a lot of this data feeds, if you buy commercially, tend to be off the shelf. So they'll have their own set of data, which basically means you might not have all the data you need, et cetera, and, and, and may incomplete. Therefore, it may not match your research objectives and questions, which is a shame. But the other thing to mention, uh, it's incredibly expensive sometimes if you get data on like Bloomberg and all these other providers. Yeah, and make sure you've got a big pocket and the, or a large checkbook to populate it because you won't be able to take a long time, it's very expensive to get the data. Okay, so we've gone through what data is required, you know, you know, primary, secondary gathering and, and quantity quality, who you should collect the data from, which is effectively around sort of like uh, sampling techniques. How do you collect the data, which is things like interviews, focus groups, questionnaires. And there's a few things at the back, uh, uh, other hints and tips, which I'd sort of put at the back here because I couldn't think where else to put them, to be completely honest. Uh, so before you will always have um, uh, problems, um, you know, as I meant before, you, you probably guess getting the sample right is very hard work. It could you will have problems. Uh, participants may not want to provide uh, all the data you want. You know, this comes back to the voting intentions I mentioned earlier. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher was winning every seat in Essex, but you couldn't find a Tory voter for a lot of money. So obviously, one people when they were doing their opinion polls. Was, they're saying one thing very different to what they're doing when they vote in the election. And also I mentioned before, you know, if you don't think about what the data is required and structure and think about it carefully, you could actually end up asking the wrong for the wrong data. So therefore, there is a, some mitigations. And this comes back to one of the questions I think was asked earlier is to try and use a combination of approaches, you know, almost like to sort of like uh, uh, one, one approach sort of like backs up the other. So if you're doing sort of research around uh, qualitative and um, uh, research, try and use both types of data, both qualitative and quantitative. As I mentioned earlier, I'm doing some research for Middlesex University on uh, measuring the success of change in asset management firms. And the data we're trying to gather there is very one around a quantitative statistical model, trying to work out, you know, what variables make change successful in an organisation. But in parallel to that, we're doing a number of interviews, uh, very much qualitative and facts, to try and understand why the change was successful or not and the idea is you want to try and get the two to um to tie in you know if they both tie in we think okay we can be quite careful the data is good but if the uh, interview says the project was fantastic and it was absolutely brilliant but when you do the statistical analysis on the project you think it was an absolute unbelievable disaster you know something's gone wrong Again, uh, primary and secondary data, I said before, another way to try and make sure everything the data is collect is around and make sure that you, you use different sources of data, collect your own data and compare it against data that other people have collected for you. Uh, you know, academic, uh, uh, that's a very good a way to do it. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were different gathering data approaches, so you have to be careful there. Uh, but the other, the other point to mention, which I've sort of touched on earlier on, is you need to be clear if one approach uh, supports the other or if they're used together. Uh, and again, as I always mentioned before, this is going to be a standard sort of, uh, trailer line. Remember to clearly state that any issues you have are actually uh, are clearly stated on any analysis. So as I mentioned before earlier, you may have problems with uh, collecting the data. Uh, therefore, if you have any problems, any gaps, any issues, make sure they're clearly documented as part of your final business report or PhD thesis type thing. Uh, and there's one other point just to mention, you know, and this is, yeah, when I was pulling together these slides, I didn't really know where to put this, and I just decided to put it here for want of anywhere else. I think one of the key points to think about is having uh, pilot studies to test the, uh, I've got the data gathering process, but you could do it for all the others. So for example, if you're going out to try and, um, um, as I mentioned, I think one of the uh, question earlier was around to try and do some political analysis on voting intentions. Uh, before you go out and sort of like canvas the whole of the United Kingdom or the whole of Europe or the whole of the United States, 
try and actually do a process to test that the gathering gathering data process is working. Uh, you're not necessarily testing the data. Um, the, the research, because if you can think that the whole of a research process is like a big, long computer program, you know, where you design the data, you gather the data, then you analyze the data. Any errors in that process make research completely pointless. Uh, therefore, I would suggest that you, um, you know, to do a mini pilot study or a feasibility study or a proof of concept on any research uh, processes to make sure everything's correct. Right. OK, um, I'm conscious. Um, We've sort of covered this earlier on before, so I've just done another sort of worked example here, which we've sort of talked about, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, I think the first one is a uh, yeah, diligence on the new supplier, uh, so therefore you, you, you might want to do a questionnaire, which is very quantitative data. You might want to go and buy some industry research on, on key providers, and no doubt you'll have some industry uh, sort of due diligence follow up questions on what happens there. Uh, the next one is looking to open a new office in a geographical region. So you might want to do some general secondary research on uh, the market research on the geographical area you're looking at. Uh, you might want to do some uh, uh, economic research in that area as well. And you, know, you also you might want to do some interviews with key customers. So if you can see there, you're doing different types of data gathering, different types of data gathering methods and different types of uh, you know, primary versus secondary. And the idea is that by doing this all like multi-tiered and different ways of doing it, you gives you a much more rounded view on what on, on, to hopefully get, come up with a better decision at the end. OK, um, so we've done upfront decisions, uh, you know, forums and research objectives supported by research questions. We've done ethics and confidentiality and the importance of doing this. And if you don't do it, you could go to prison. We've spent quite a lot of time on data gathering and apologies for stretching that out, but it's quite a key, it's a key area. All the issues around the quantitative and qualitative data, gathering data yourself and as in primary, gathering data secondary, making sure you've got sampling and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we'll probably move on to analysing the data, which is effectively the crux. But I don't know if Antonio, there's any questions that uh, the uh, audience have, have questioned, I guess. That right, Fred? Hi, Paul. Uh, yes, we have two um, two questions coming in. One, The first question, I don't have the name. It oh. has been uh, um, asked from an iPhone. Um, <laughs> that's that's uh, person's what, name. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's an iPhone. <laughs> What uh, what approach do we uh, well do you recommend for getting um, into data modeling? So uh, it provides two options: more technical with mastering any particular tool, or second, uh, uh, generic with obtaining professional and qualific uh, professional qualification or academic research field that will help. What was it, what was the area the, the, the caller was in for? So I didn't you didn't quite understand. Yeah. So. What, uh, what what approach would you recommend uh, for getting data uh, yeah. into data modeling? Mm. So um, the first one would, would be more technical with mastering any particular tool, or uh, the other one, uh, the second one, which is a more generic approach, but obtaining professional qualifications or academic research field that will... Right. There is actually some slides on sort of modeling under data analyzing, the, which is under the next section, but I'll just do a little... A 30 second preview so data modeling is um is, is, is an interesting area because you have different ways you can do it um so the key thing is you can buy lots of um i think i mean the package i'm using is called spss uh, so I, actually i don't know what it stands for i think it's so statistical passages for social sciences or something like that and uh what that can actually do that data modeling that will actually when you get lots and lots of data you can pull it in press a button and that the package itself will try and come out with any uh, links and themes across the data between it. Uh, you get some really bizarre themes and some of you think, no, this can't be right. Uh, but that's the area. I think if you want to get into that area as a career, uh, I think before you dive into the packages, I think it's a case of you probably just need to sort of learn the trade. Uh, so I would therefore maybe... Um, look at academia qualifications i don't know if the bcs do something on data modeling i'm sure they might do i mean but there are other professional qualifications is to try and learn before you get into the actual technology learn the basics um because there's a, a buy some good books on statistics uh, i think there is a worry is that you people dive into the actual technology without knowing the basics and uh, uh, some of these tools are i mean believe me they are so complicated you, you, i mean i 
I'm not, I'm not an expert on them, but some of these think I can't work out head or tail what they're doing. Uh, but it's, I would say the most important thing is to learn the basics. You know, then once you've done that, is I would say there's probably three areas to take forward. Uh, I think the first area is to keep doing doing learning uh, like through classrooms and online courses. So you can imagine that as well. I would say the second area is to try and work with people who are good in this, very good in this area, you know, learn from experts. And the third area is to do it yourself. You know, so they're the three main areas of learning, how I would approach that. Uh, just as a comment, uh, we have a couple of members, uh, Swati and Simon, saying that uh, SPSS stands for a statistic, a statistical package for social science. Oh, it does. Yeah, I thought it was social services, but yes, that's, I've, I've been using it. I have no idea what it stands for. So that's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that comment. Anyway, I'll go away a lot wiser than I joined. Any other okay. questions, Antonio? Sorry. We have one more question for Rivena. Uh, do you have any tips on identifying bias, gaps, in your data other than a peer review bias and gap i think um yeah i think the uh i mean guess if you've got gaps um I mean, you will know if you've got gaps if you want to collect um say for example you want to understand sort of like buying in te- um I'm trying to think a good example a real example I'm trying to think um yeah so for example you're doing voting intentions you want to try and work out you know i mean i live out in essex uh and you might want to say we want to see whether the uh, seat of brentwood and Ongar, which is where i live is going to be tory next year so you will create a sample of people to go to and you might say you know, for example we're going to say well half the population is above 50 half the population is below 50 uh and therefore we're going to sort of like split the pop- we're going to do a sample of a, a number of people above 50 a number of people below 50 and then work out the split between men and women. So you know full well roughly uh, how many men over a certain age, how many women over a certain age, how many men under an age, and women under an age you need to contact. So the first question would be is that if you don't get that uh, answer to match that sort of like sampling, you've got some bias. So, for example, uh, anybody under a certain age doesn't respond or doesn't want to respond, you know full well that you're going to be skewed or you're going to be siloed because something you haven't got a full representation. So you can say the results can't be uh, generalized uh, because they are biased. The second area would be is to do um, maybe two or three different samples, uh, separate samples. Maybe do one, as I mentioned before, over an age, under an age, men and women. You might want to say uh, students versus unemployed versus retirees. Again, split between men and women. You might want to do some people living at the posh end of town, the other people living at the, on the council state at the other end. So you've got like three or four different samples and then do the same, ask the same questions to that different samples. Um, and on the assumption that obviously you get a good response in the samples because you're doing this a similar, you, 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 you're reviewing the data differently, you're almost like testing different data sets. Uh, and the answer with that is that if you do different data sets, you should be able to get much more uh, an agreed. And if everybody comes back and say, well, we think the uh, the Tory is going to get 60% of the vote and one of them says 59% of the vote and one says 62 and one says 66, you think we're all in this ballpark of 60, so that looks good. But if one says Tory is going to win and the next one said Labour is going to win, you know there's something materially wrong. And then the idea is you might want to then just do another sample, yeah. There's no real way. There's no real, I think the key thing about bias, is you, you, when you're doing a lot of research, when you're going through it and you say, you think, I, I know I'm getting gaps in my data and I know that people who I need to speak to aren't responding. I know there's bias. You, yeah. And that is where you just need to note it down in your final report and to say, like, you know, for whatever we did, uh, this part of the sample weren't interested. You know, therefore, I can't. We can generalize on the rest of the sample, but not on this sample. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, anything that's, else? That's that's all for now. Thank you. Okay, that's cool. Okay, let's move on to so it's done before upfront decisions, which we've done, uh ethics and confidentiality and going to prison. If you don't do it, it's the next one. Uh we've got data gathering, which obviously we spoke about in a bit of detail. And now we're analyzing the data. So um running through. So this is obviously the crux of the project, I why we're doing everything. Uh, basically, what you want to do is consolidate all the data that's been gathered into some sort of format that hopefully answers the research question, which you set up at the beginning and therefore meets the research objective. Um, again, this is a vast area and is masters of degrees and science and PhDs on this. So I won't go through it in the next 10 minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll try and give a high level overview. 
But remember, the different types of data, there's different types of quantitative and qualitative, there's different types of ways of analyzing the data across the two. Um, and again, it's problematic. So uh, if we just work our way through, so we've got quantitative, qualitative, combined, and hints and tips. So if we look at quantitative, which is statistical numbers, uh, rule type data, again, there's different ways of doing this. Um, for those who did uh, GCSE maths or A-level maths, you'd be sweating now trying to remember all of this. Uh, there's different ways you can play around with it. You can do uh, what uh, they call central tendency, which is effectively uh, what the rest of us call an average. Um, it's a mean mode medium, very simple to do, very calculated, but you do get some really bizarre ones like 2.4 children and things like that. And well, the average number of legs that people have got in the UK is 1.99 legs. I'm not aware of anybody who's got, uh, got 1.99 legs, but it's very easy to do and it gives you some sort of sampling, uh, some, some sort of like uh, some, some sort of high average uh, dispersation, uh, which is basically uh, how well, how much is the data spread out? Uh, you can use things like variance charts and standard deviation. Again, you know, you, it allows you to take the data and work out how spread out the data is. Again, a very simple process to do. And again, quite powerful, but you do get some bizarre results if the value is wrong. One of the other ones that's very keen, it's very much around a lot of machine learning techniques do these days, is very much around what's called a regression analysis. Uh, and it's just basically trying to say is a trend analysis, um, trying to work out... Um, uh, how does one part of the data impact the other part of the data? Uh, for example, I mean, a good example would be along the lines of, you know, um, the older the person gets, unfortunately, more likely they're going to pass away with COVID-19. And if you look at those diagrams on the chart, you can see along the bottom, the age, up the top, the chance of dying of COVID and all these, all these diagrams. The challenge with regression analysis, you get some really, 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 really results. I remember when I was learning about this many years ago, uh, we did some analysis. I read a, a case study. There was a clear link between the amount, the size of your telephone bill and the amount of your ice cream eaten. So the more ice cream you ate, the larger your telephone bill was and vice versa. And um, I don't think AT&T and Tina Mera went out and sold ice cream. But basically what it was, actually it was nothing to do with those two. The, uh, the two were actually due to uh, uh, disposable income. So the more income you have, the more te the larger your telephone bill is, and the more income you have, the amount of ice cream you would purchase. So again, you got often stand back if you see some of these trends and ask yourself, does this really, really make sense? I mean, or is it just some bizarre? And remember, uh, correlation doesn't mean causation, uh, uh, which is another sort of like statistical term. But uh, for those like me who aren't statisticians, it basically means while two things may be linked together, uh, it doesn't mean one is causing the other. Uh, and as you go before, the size of your telephone bill doesn't mean you can eat more ice cream. That's because they just happen to link to each other. Uh, but basically what it basically means is uh, they are uh, the causation between them is the more income you have or more free income you have, the size of your telephone bill. Uh, next one is uh, uh, groupings, uh, where you just, it's similar to trends, but you just chain to group things around in clusters. Uh, for example, um, one of the key things, um, uh, Giuliani, I think was um, the, uh, uh, the mayor of New York City many, many years ago. He did a lot of cluster analysis around certain areas where, uh, where crimes took place in New York. And he would just say, you know, this area of New York uh, or, or, or Brooklyn or what have you, uh, uh, certain types of crime would actually happen at this time of day. Uh, and therefore, and he, and he analysed it, analysed it, and he came up with some predictive models that where he could actually send the police to say, we think, you know, there's a good chance there's going to be some sort of robbery around here. And the police would be there either to stop the robbery or catch them in the, on the, um, on the, in, in the act. And the last one is around behaviours. Um, and is, again, it's great. This is a really fantastic, interesting area, I must admit. And I, if, one, if, you're, if any of the callers on the line got interest in this area, I would highly recommend to do it. It's basically around, you know, trying to work out, uh, understand people's behaviour. So you can, you can build things like decision trees, which are like big, long flow charts on the data to determine, you know, for example, you know, if, you, um, if this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens and it's very cause and effect, you can build algos, uh, which are very complex model, uh, sums uh, a formula to do it. Uh, you can build data models, which I think one of the callers mentioned earlier. Uh, and you can bring this thing called neuro networks, which is a, a fantastic word for something that's incredibly, sounds very incredibly complicated, but when you understand it, it's actually, uh, well, my uh, a very amateur level is actually reasonably easy to to understand 
but these are very, very, very powerful tools and very much the, uh, the, the, the way going forward. I think the issues you have, you need a lot of data uh, to do this you know, because you, you model hundreds of thousands of data. Um, they do need a lot of these, need a lot of testing and development, not like trying to do a, 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 an average where you can just put on a big long spreadsheet and press the add button. And to be honest with you, some of the behaviors and the models are very hard to understand. Uh, for those who remember the financial crisis, a lot of the financial models or algos that they were called uh, didn't predict the financial crisis. So there's also, apart from the fact they're hard to understand, they're not always correct. Right. So we've done the quantitative data research techniques. Uh, let's move on to qualitative. And to be honest with you, it's actually quite hard uh, to actually uh, 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 to give an approach on this uh, because it's very relative because you're trying to analyze text data, opinions and facts. Uh, but the key thing is when you're trying to do research qualitative data, the key thing is to try and look for common themes across the data set. Um, um, and, um, and normally when I do that, when I do summaries of a paper, I will create some tags. Um, you know, when I do an interview note or, a, or, I'm, uh, or I'm reading the paper, I will do some sort of tag to say with common themes. And, you know, I might say, for example, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. When I was doing a, a, a literature review and interviews on change management, one of the com th common things that came out was a, uh, uh, the ability of having knowledgeable management on a change project. And uh, one of the key things that came out of that was I'll have a tag there, and I used to call it T1 uh, or something silly like that. And I would say this, this illustrates T1. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it just have to be very organized, and it, it, is, it, is quite, uh, it can be quite laborious. Therefore, yeah, you know, a lot of the qualitative data requires a lot of a rework and going backwards and forth. And I think that was one of the points that one of the uh, authors, one of the questioners mentioned earlier, that he would review a number of papers and go back to review it again. But fortunately, there's not a lot you can do about that. That's just the nature of the beast. And again, as well as a lot of back and forth, you're constantly reviewing the data because it is uh, opinions and qualitative and text to make sure everything's covered and correct. You may end up reviewing a paper and suddenly realize you've got some new trends which basically means you'll go back and review all the other analysis to make sure the interview notes that's correct. Regarding combined data, so we've done quantitative data, which is statistical data, and the qualitative data, which is all uh, rich text, uh, formats, opinions, and interview notes, do the combined data. Again, it really, really depends on your data um, and whether you're actually using the statistical type data to support the qualitative data or vice versa again i typically if i was doing the analysis of this i would do the quantitative data analysis on one set and do the quality data completely different and then when you've actually got towards the end of the project and you want to do it you bring them together and compare them to make sure they can portray the same issues um, again, I sort of slightly covered this you know can the themes be covered explained by the statistical analysis so if everybody's saying something's a good idea in the interviews and you complete stats on it, do the stats stay the same thing? If they don't, under, you, you, there is something going wrong or astray and you will need to go back. Uh, any gaps or anomalies in the stats, can they be explained by the quantitative data, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so on that, we've covered the stats, uh, we've covered the quality, if we've done combine, and a few other hints and tips. Um, and this is more of a general analyzing the data Basically, the key thing is ensure that the data matches the research questions. Sorry, ensure the analysis matches the research questions and research objectives. It's very easy to stray off course and completely ignore stuff and go sideways. Uh, but the key thing is the, you're there to answer the research questions and the objectives. Um, make sure you do it. Be mindful of previous problems. Uh, I mentioned earlier on there's issues with statistical analysis and sampling and in biased data and incomplete data and people not wanting to, to respond. Um, therefore, that is expected. It's a pain, it's annoying and very demotivating and frustrating. But make sure if you've got any major issues, especially if you think it's going to uh, uh, block, uh, uh, cause the data or the outputs or the final research to be uh, faulty, let people know. The key thing is make sure the data analysis is as robust and as rigorous as possible. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the key things I try to stress is to use data over and over. So I use multiple sources of data, multiple data collection methods, multiple research techniques. In the same way, you should try and use multiple analysis techniques. So if you're doing statistics, just don't use the average. Try and use some standard deviation, do some regression testing. 
you know, and when you've done the analysis, you know, sit back and says, does it make sense? Why on earth would somebody with a large telephone bill want to buy more ice cream? Does it actually, does it sound plausible? I mean, ask yourself. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i surprised that, I mean, I, I would have picked that up, I would hope, but I'm sure people don't. Again, if you think there's any peculiarities and it doesn't quite make sense, uh, it may be completely correct, but no any issues and concerns in the final report. Uh, key one here, this is an interesting one, especially if you're doing a, a business project, don't ignore bad unexpected incomes, even if it upsets uh, management. Uh, for example, I remember doing a project once and it was it was actually around uh, demerging uh, a company. And when we did the research and the analysis, we found it was a bad idea and the management didn't like that. And that was a very uncomfortable an hour and a half in their boardroom, I can tell you. But because we had all the stats and analysis, we, we could stand by our research. Also be mindful that you can't always answer all the research questions as you bear the research questions are a subset of the research objective. Again, more common than you think, especially if there's some real bizarre ones, um, make sure, you, but if you can't do it again, it's an issue or a gap in research, make sure it's clearly documented. Uh, the other one is actually one of my big faults, actually, uh, or many of my many faults, but my particularly biggest fault at the moment is trying to be too absolute. Uh, things are very black, black or white. And I'll, Normally, I say it's a shades of grey. I get sniggering people in the audience, but things are very black or white. There will be some sort of un, uh, 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 ambiguity or uncertainty about any facts. You know, for example, you know, we would, when I was doing um, some research, you may say along the lines of, um, we we surveyed 100 projects, and 94% of them said that having uh, supportive management made the project successful, but the remaining six said they didn't. Uh, you're not lying you're telling the facts so therefore you create a certain amount of um, you make sure you reflect it and not being too abs absolute and uh, one of the other items down here relates to the um, uh, bias uh, again as I mentioned you can have bias going through the research process for example you're not you know you've got issues with the sample the data is not correct uh, you the, uh, you've asked the wrong questions but people uh, there's also a human bias to this as well because we're all humans uh, well, uh, you lot are I maybe not and people have their own personal bias on this you know we're all humans you know for example um, uh, I mean I always remember I'm, I still am a strong uh, remainer uh, I have lots of friends who are strong leavers uh, and uh, when I ever read any story about Brexit, I was very biased about uh, being a Remainer. And I had to sort of like really think about to make sure I was biased. Uh, one of the other areas is called confirmation bias, is where you're so desperate to get something agreed, you find a piece of data that backs up your argument and you grab onto it and take it forward. Uh, this is quite common, actually, in, um, I'm trying to think, um, for those who remember the, the weapons of mass destruction, uh, sort of like uh, for, uh, about, uh, when was it, probably about? 20 odd years ago now is when the uh, the, the, the Labour government uh, Tony Blair's government in the UK was trying to find evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq so they could actually uh, go send the military forces in uh, basically what they did is they found some evidence and uh, jumped onto that twisted it a little bit and then basically went with that where realistically they should have done much more research and found out well they could have been weapons of mass destruction I don't know but uh, much more rounded view and the other one is management pressure. Um, and for example, I've worked on projects where you know, you've gone into the research project and management think they know what the answer is or they know what the answer is. You know, What's the best way to run our company? The answer is outsource it. And you're trying to work your way through a project. So therefore, you need to be very careful that you're not being pressured into a decision by management. And the other one is, uh, again, another common one is try to counterbalance. Uh, what is you may have very, very strong personal biases on a certain subject and you're aware of that, which is good. But you're saying so often to try and counter uh, balance your own personal biases, you swing the other way. Um, it's a bit like a um, and then basically you create a complete problem on the other side. OK, so that covers the upfront ethics, uh, spelt wrong, uh, data gathering, analyzing and uh, areas. And then quickly just move on just before we do a wrap up is the final decision. Again, um, the final business decision, the approach is specific to each organization, but I suggest two prongs. The first, you probably need a sort of like an executive summary. And for each of the research questions, um, you know, so six or seven of them, has it been answered? 
Are there any issues to be noted? You know, issues with the sample, gaps in the data. Is there any further action required? Even more research, which is a good way for us, a consultant like myself, to try and jump up more business. Are there any other side uh, observations that have been discovered that's worth mentioning? And by the fact that you've answered all these research questions, it should bring you all the way back to the research objectives and say whether the research objective has been met or not. And the other good thing to do is, as well as these extra summaries, when you do the research, uh, is to uh, talk about two things. Uh, one is provide, I call the journey of the research. So you would have gone through maybe how you design what data to collect, how, to, how you design uh, what data to, uh, how you analyze the data, the issues you've had. Put that as maybe as an appendix. You may need to anomalize it, as, as mentioned earlier. But it basically gives you some credit, uh, some sort of evidence, uh, and also it helps explain if you've got any problems. But ultimately, remember the key thing is almost halfway down that slide is to say, has the overall research objective been met? And that brings us to, to the it at the moment. So um, the, to summarise, just before we go into final questions, um, key thing is upfront work is required. Um, you know, perfect plan prevents poor research, I guess. I was going to swear there. Key thing is uh, focus on uh, the senior forum to oversee it. You need some sort of like super higher body to oversee everything and like a project steer co or a board of governors or a uh, academic panel. Remember ethics and confidentiality. Um, it's now a legal issue. So you will go to prison and get big fines. Remember to define the research objective, which is effectively why are you going to spend the rest of your life asking questions to understand it, and the actual research questions that will break down the objective into tangible stuff. Remember data gathering. It's, uh, you've got qualitative and quantitative or a combination of different data types, each with their good points and their bad points. Remember that you um, you need you can collect the data physically, either primary, which is yourself going around, get the data, secondary, using other people's data, or last but definitely not least, a combination of both. Remember, you need to create a sample of the full population to collect the data on, and there was a number of slides and methods on that. And remember, once you've actually worked out what data you want to gather, how, the sample you want to collect it from, there's different ways to collect the data, you know, ranging anything from data fees to interviews to focus groups, etc. And remember, last but not least, is the uh, final analyzing data. You know, this is actually the crux of it all and often uh, gets forgotten about by me in particular. Uh, so there are various methods, uh, but note the advantages and disadvantages of analyzing the data that you spent a lot of time gathering. And final, you've got your final write up. And the key thing is really um, whatever you say in the research uh, uh, in, the, in the final write-up is make sure you can say, has the research objective been met and uh, met? And that's the whole reason you can do it. And that brings me to the end. Um, so apologies for overrunning a little bit. Um, I don't know if, Antonio, you've got any. Uh, uh, before that, on the right-hand side is my contact details, email, Twitter, and LinkedIn thingamajig. So feel free to email me on those. Uh, if you've got any questions or, or on LinkedIn, more than willing to uh, answer any questions or any general feedback on the presentation but I don't know if Antonio there's any other questions that have popped up at all sure I have one question uh, let's 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 see if so, someone else I guess that we can have a few more minutes uh, the question is from John Hi, the question is how do you uh, account for the huge variations in the output from algorithms uh, prediction so uh, here he's putting the frame uh, in background, in context, uh, the COVID infections, hospitalizations, death. We we seem to have diff very different sources, diff very different. Mm. Yeah, I think the issue on the COVID stuff is, I mean, particularly generally, is um, you need to understand, uh, obviously, um, they will collect data from different sources. Uh, you need to ensure that the data has been collected, is, there is some sort of consistency over it. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert. On, well, uh, apart from having a jab, that's what I know about COVID. Uh, but you need to ensure that you, the data that is being collected is consistent. Um, uh, different uh, countries, uh, and even different parts of the United Kingdom, who, who collected COVID data in different ways. Uh, I think there was some. If I go back, there was. Um, uh, I, was, I think the the, the 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 assumption at the moment is if somebody died within two, and but they've been diagnosed with COVID within the previous two weeks. Something, the death of foot down the COVID, which is not always the well, that's the assumption, uh, and therefore you need to ensure that the uh, all this, the data assumptions are all the same, 
and they're not. So basically, you, you're off to a bad start already. Also, I would suggest that you try and understand the different uh, COVID uh, models themselves. Again, they're all different. Uh, I would personally go for the scientific ones, the academia ones, because they're much more uh, likely to be truthful. Uh, the political ones are often trying to portray a message. Uh, but I think the key thing is, uh, this is a good example, actually, the more I think about it, is that uh, while they're all trying to predict COVID deaths, they're all using different data and different ways of doing it. So there is almost impossible to compare them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only way to do it is actually to run multiple models, which they're actually doing and try and compare them all. They're all coming out with similar predictions uh, and you think that they're all probably working well but the COVID thing is an absolute nightmare yeah yeah I mean, they're all they're all different programs you know it's like running a uh, uh four or five different programs for the same thing but uh, they're all working in completely different ways yeah <laughs> brilliant so i that's all what they have so i just want to thank him again and probably going to give the the word to simon thank you very much paul it has been a splendid uh, talk today thank you very much Indeed. Thank you very much, Paul. I can um, give you a very um, significant piece of data analysis here. Um, I can say that 100% of people's comments in the chat have been very positive and complimentary. Oh, that's good news, yeah, yeah. And everyone says it was <laughs> excellent. And indeed it was. It was action-packed, full of uh, really good information and uh, I know I, for one, am going to uh, watch it again on the video <laughs> and read to your slides. Uh, okay, that's good. So much good stuff there. So many thanks to you, Paul, and uh, I hope people do get in touch with you for uh, further uh, information if they wish to. Thank you again, Paul, and uh, we'll see you all again next time. It's uh, time to turn off and say goodbye. Okay, all the best. Thanks, everybody.